Now, tonight's presentation is on the Sonics Electric Aircraft. It'll be an update just prior to Air Venture. Um, and it is uh, with Sonics, uh, Sonics Aircraft Limited. Our presenter tonight is Jeremy Winnett. He is CEO of Sonics Aircraft. He's an aeronautical engineer, a private pilot, a lifetime EA member, and a member of our local EA chapter. Now, with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Jeremy, and he will take it from there. So welcome tonight, Jeremy. Unmute myself. All right. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you, all of you tonight. And uh, my goal tonight is to give you uh, just a, a, a small sampling of um, a lot of things we've been doing with this electric e-flight project. Uh, it's, been, it's been a very active project. Uh, we've logged thousands and thousands of hours on this project. And we want to uh, share as openly as we can with the public about uh, what this effort has entailed and what the goals are. Uh, first off, there's a lot of logos on this first screen. Uh, the first one you see here is the Sonics logo, Sonics Aircraft LLC. That's the facility where we're conducting um, the entire project, the home base, if you will. We also, on the right-hand side here, have our Hornet's Nest uh, logo, research and development. This is the research arm of Sonics Aircraft LLC. Uh, it's headed by my father, John Monette but there's a ton of people involved in that research and development arm, and I'll talk about them as the presentation continues. And we also have our official eFlight logo over here, and that is uh, the eFlight initiative or the eFlight project. Um, it's really come to encompass all of the electric activities and endeavors that we have going uh, at Sonics. So let's start with the logical question, what exactly is eFlight? Uh, if you're new to the project, I'll briefly give you some, some stats about it, or some information about it. Uh, E-Flight is essentially a team of four individuals, uh, along with other contributors and supporters who are pursuing practical electric aircraft and electric flight. Uh, the four individuals, namely, are Pete Buck, uh, John Monette, Andrew Pierce, and myself. Uh, but there's a lot of our other family members and a lot of other uh, team members at Sonics who've contributed greatly to the, to the project. Um, the eFlight project was publicly unveiled at AirVenture 2007, so many of you are probably not new to the project. Um, that's when we unveiled it the opening day of the air show in a very basic form. Uh, we had the airframe and a couple of component parts, and we set a very, um, uh, a very auspicious goal. I mean, we wanted a, <laughs> ambitious goals, what I meant to say, to, to get this done as soon as we could. And, and what we found is it's... Uh, it's a huge project, a gigantic undertaking, and we've seen a lot of success. The goal of the eFlight team is to provide a practical and affordable fully electric power plant and airframe with an acceptable level of performance to the flying public. So there's a lot of key, um, key words there. And as with all Sonics projects, we continuously endeavor to maintain our core industry-leading values of affordability, simplicity, uh, versatility, performance, quality, engineering, ease of maintenance. These are all things that drive us on a daily basis in everything that we do. Um, but those goals, back to the goal of the eFlight team, the practical and affordable electric power plant and airframe. And you'll hear that as an uh, uh, underwriting theme in everything I talk about tonight. So what makes eFlight different? You know, you, you've been reading and seeing a lot of different electric uh, projects, uh, namely and mainly ultralights uh, along with large corporate endeavors with very deep pockets. Um, while our initiative, while the eFlight initiative was launched with the intention of using as many off-the-shelf components as we could, um, we, we quickly found that almost no high-power electric motors, controls, storage devices even exist to meet our demands. Um, so unfortunately, while it's really nice to say we can go purchase a motor somewhere and purchase a controller from somewhere, uh, they just don't exist at this point. Uh, the eFlight team, well, we have them existing, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a little bit. The eFlight team has developed from the ground up uh, our own brushless DC motor, our own control boards and system, our own COM bus, power electronics, and contracted for a high-energy battery 
designed for the e-flight system. So uh, there, there's a lot there too, but that's every major component of the system that we either own or have contracted for. I'm going to talk a lot about uh, some of the specifics there tonight. This is a slide we put together a couple years ago to visually put kind of uh, on a continuum, if you will, uh, flight time on the uh, x-axis here uh, and performance on the y-axis. So it's kind of like giving people a feel for what you can expect with different types of aircraft. At one extreme up at the top, we have our sport aircraft, our YX. And this is actually what we've chosen as our proof of concept uh, for the e-flight system. And those of you that have been to AirVenture the last couple of years have actually seen our N270DC prototype YX uh, with the system and even saw it run last year uh, if you came to the uh, ALC, the Learning Center. Um, this proof of concept YX, you can see with current battery technology, which is this block in red, which ends halfway, with current battery technology with a reasonable power level, you really only have about 30 minutes of flight time down here at the bottom. Uh, as battery technology continues to improve and expand, then we can expect longer flight times. So over an hour, that's kind of our key if we're going for a nice recreational flight to do some sport aerobatics, we want to fly for about an hour. Um, and, you know, if you use your power wisely, you obviously can get more than an hour, uh, but we're talking about a flight where you're going to have a lot of fun. Um, then at the other extreme down here at the bottom, we have our Xenos motor glider. And that's what everybody actually, I would, I would argue, most uh, of the electric aircraft you've seen are really in that motor glider, glider class. The reason is they require less power to get off the ground because of their big wing area. The limiting factor is that they don't go as fast, so they don't feel like a sport aircraft. They're, the sport aircraft will be up here at the top and the glider like would be down here at the bottom. Well, that means with less power you can get a longer flight duration, but you're not going as fast. Obviously, as battery technology expands, we could be out here uh, in a couple of hour flight time uh, or more. Um, and then we talked about a next generation ESA, which maybe would be a hybrid between the YX and the Xenos. And that, I'll talk about that at the end of the presentation as one of our concepts for the system. But for now, it made sense to go uh, as a starting point with an airframe we knew and an airframe that we knew uh, with the AeroV engine, an 80 horsepower engine. We know how it feels. It feels great. It's a very high performance uh, airplane, especially for the money. Um, and it's a very robust airframe to use uh, for sport flying, for our aerobatics. So this is the N270DC as it sits today. Um, and that's what we decided to start with for our system. Now, this is a graphical representation here, or more of a more of an iconic representation of what the uh, e-flight system looks like, the battery-powered aircraft system schematic. And I'm going to talk about each of the components that you see in this slide, uh, the motor, the battery, the controller, the instrumentation. This is taking that same icon-esque uh, representation and turning it into a flat layout. Those of you that are into 2D schematics will be in heaven here. But the same basic components. Up front, you have your motor and power electronics uh, running back to your, your controller. You got a DC to DC converter. So all this would kind of be within your uh, battery, your BMS box, your control box. Um, and then over here would be your uh, 270 volt uh, DC uh, battery containment unit or battery. This would be your battery supplying the charge. And uh, then we have a couple of other components in the control board. And then the instrumentation, which is very important, and I'll talk about uh, during this presentation, including a propulsion instrument and a flight instrument. Uh, this is the direct feedback to the pilot. So let's talk about some of these at a high level. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be at the beginning, middle, and end of this presentation, I'll be plugging AirVenture. Because if you're really interested in learning more about eFlight and seeing these component parts, nothing better you can do than, than come to the air show and actually see them. Um, let's talk about the motor. Uh, looks like a really cool red coffee can. <laughs> That's about exactly what size it is. Uh, it's a 55 kilowatt brushless DC motor. So those of you that are familiar with the conversion, 55 kilowatts would be about 74 horsepower. 
So a, uh, a Volkswagen engine, not quite an Aero-V, which we rate at 80 horsepower, but pretty darn close. Um, it currently has a mixture of sensorless back EMF and single sensor for commutation. So with electric motors, uh, I guess the best way for the layperson to understand how you run an electric motor, uh, think about it as uh, the timing on your internal combustion engine in the firing order of your spark plugs. You need a firing order in an electric motor just like you do in those internal combustions, and that's what we call the commutation. The cleaner the commutation, the more efficient your motor is. The more efficient your motor is, the longer you can fly on a, on a set load. Um, purpose design for speeds and loads direct drive. This is an overwhelming theme of Sonic's aircraft. It's become a signature of my father's and everybody affiliated with Sonic's. Uh, we love direct drives because that's less stuff that can fail. That's less weight. And uh, we believe that with proper propeller design that you can have a very close to the same efficiency. Um, we have an aircraft light mount system, uh, no maintenance air cool system. We also believe in air cooling for exactly the same reasons we like direct drive. It's lightweight and simple if you can make it work. Uh, containment for the high energy electromagnetic pulses included in this little box underneath the motor. Uh, we have temperature sensing and control the motor and electronics. Uh, that's kind of the high side, if you will. Most of it's contained in that box. Um, and it's very important to monitor temperatures. You don't want to burn up your motor, just like you don't want to do for your internal combustion. And we also have a high power battery connection directly to the IMS. So it, it uh, plugs, if you will, the battery plugs directly into the motor, uh, that, high, that high power box. This is what it looked like in 2009. Um, there's the motor, uh, the containment box right underneath, uh, or the high power box, if you will, controller. This was the battery management box, and then in the back, uh, underneath the windshield, we have the actual control box. And then this big thing that says caution high voltage was intended to have the batteries loaded up uh, into it. This is what it looks like in 2010, and I'll be introducing you to some of the components. That's Pete uh, sitting behind the motor here. But this is now our 3.0 electric motor. It's uh, undergone quite a few refinements. Uh, this is our new uh, contracted for high power battery, 14,500 kilowatt hour battery, weighs uh, about 300 pounds. And then there's our uh, control box, which you'll see the inside of in just a few minutes. So it's undergone a fairly drastic change. Every major component has been changed in the last year uh, as we've learned more and as we've refined the system more. If you'd like to learn more about the motor, hey, come to AirVenture. Uh, 10 to 11 a.m., uh, Pete, Pete Buck, one of our partners, uh, the designer of the motor, is going to be giving a presentation on the design and packaging at the uh, Aviation Learning Center. The main uh, controller unit, or the motor controller unit, this is uh, back EMF and censored motor control, that commutation I was talking about, contained in this brain box, if you will. It's fully isolated. You'll hear all of us talk about isolation a lot. Uh, very important when you talk about isolating people from high energy and high power, and uh, that's really what this intention is. And also, you've got an isolated DC-DC converter. That takes the high power uh, of, let's say, 300 volts, and it knocks it down to 12 volts so you can run all your electronics and other affiliated uh, systems on it. We have that integrated. Um, failure sensing circuitry, current limit control, motor and current sensing, motor switching electronics, temp and control, a lot of the stuff I already talked about. Uh, we also have a communication bus, and that's a brain within a brain, if you will, that sorts out the information and sends it to the right places. Uh, it also has a disable switch, so you it's disabled while it's in charge mode, as well as over voltage control, because that's honestly how a lot of people burn up their batteries and burn up their high power systems is through charging. Uh, this is what the control box looked like in 2009. Those of you that came and watched the, uh, the E-Flight motor run during AirVenture saw it running just off this motor controller, which happened to be version 9, or actually version 8. Um, and it ran uh, up through the firewall to the high power box. Uh, notice there's a big gap in here, and there was also nothing in this side of the box if we had a top view. And this is what the motor control box look like, uh, looks like today. Uh, 2010. This is now motor controller version 10. This is that DC to DC converter I just talked about. 
By the way, every single circuit board you see in this box was uh, custom designed and built uh, by the eFlight team. Um, this is the uh, motor, the, the bus controller I was just talking about. Uh, sends the signals and manages the information where it goes and how. And right next to it is the SLA charger. So that's responsible for when we switch the system to charging mode uh, and it doles out, does what it needs to do. We also even added a little flight computer over here in the corner to be able to record uh, flight data. So pretty exciting. Lots of changes happen in this box. And as you can see, lots of wiring and uh, lots of good old-fashioned hard work making the system uh, work. If you'd like to learn more about our motor controller, come on to AirVenture 2010, uh, presented by Andrew Pierce. He and his wife, Rosemary, are the two uh, that have been doing the uh, design work of our PCBs uh, and uh, all the routing of those components, trying to fit them in as small a package as possible. Uh, huge tasks. But that'll be uh, Wednesday of the show, afternoon. Um, let's talk about the battery. Uh, this is the part of the system that the eFlight team has the least amount of control over uh, and the least amount of expertise in in our inner circle. So that's why we had to contract it. Um, the, the important part of the battery, same thing, there's the isolated on-off control. You don't want to zap anybody as they try to turn the battery off. Uh, main power digital and passively fused, that's important to say. So you actually have to apply power to get it to work and you actually have a fuse uh, so that if something should go wrong, you'd have a short, it would uh, break the fuse and, and, and provide safe uh, opportunities to handle it. Uh, integrated pre-charge circuit, that's something we've just added in the last few weeks. Uh, fully isolated cell monitoring, so particularly when you get into the high power batteries and the high power polymer uh, batteries, lithium polymers, you really need to monitor them carefully. So they ha it has its own brain. Uh, temperature monitoring, very important. We love air cooling. We've got high and low cell cutoffs, and, and this is very important, the status and the health through the com, com bus. We want to know how that battery is doing as we fly the plane. That's our gas gauge. Uh, charging control through the com bus and individual cell balancing. So there's a lot that has to happen with uh, these uh, lighter weight, higher uh, energy density batteries, and we're doing it. This is what it looked like in 2009, and I want you just to focus on this box here, right behind the motor, and this battery pack right here on the ground. Uh, we, we had some very bad experiences with this battery pack, and it's time to tell the world, and we'll be talking about that more at AirVenture. But um, quite a few thousands of dollars sitting there in that battery pack, and uh, what we found is that these cells were less than ideal, and I'll talk about that uh, as we move to the next slides. Um, 2010 battery configuration, there is our custom battery pack. It's a beautiful uh, piece. Um, it is uh, fully uh, in encapsulated. It is its own unit, and it's on a forklift here, and we're getting ready to load it up into the cage or the motor mount up in here, and it has four mount points. And it's as far aft as we can get for CG purposes and be able to fly our YX with it. So that's a custom designed and built battery uh, for uh, the eFlight project. Not inexpensive either, by the way, as this is a very cutting-edge technology. Um, then let's talk about the charger. Um, charging unit is kind of an external unit that's going to sit outside the airplane, and it's going to plug in uh, to the battery control box, and uh, you're going to sit and charge. Uh, most common question I get is, how long is it going to take to charge this 14,500 kilowatt hour pack? About four hours on 220 volts. Uh, so, you know, an afternoon, you're ready to go fly again. Uh, or a few hour break. A uh, 10 hour charge if you have 110, which is what most people are going to have uh, readily available. Uh, it's controlled by our COM bus, so it's keeping track of the charging. As I said, it's a very uh, important state of charge to keep track of, and, and the health of the batteries is very important. And we even built in compatibility with things like solar cells, uh, which uh, are not very practical now for putting on the wings or providing uh, immediate power, but it is practical for those of us uh, looking to charge overnight and be as green as we can with it. Jeremy? And it's also, yes. yes. I have a question along those lines. Uh, Bradford sure. had a question. He says, given the advances in solar technology that will now allow solar panels to be much lighter and virtu virtually paper thin, has there been any thought in integrating the panels into the massive surface area of the wings? 
uh -huh. not only would this re increase range slightly, but allow you know for a free fuel up when the plane is tied down. Sure, I, I would dispute with anybody that says this would increase range a measurable amount. Um, right now, solar cells just aren't there yet to to be to be brutally honest, Brad. But I, I would love to see them continue, and I completely agree with your concept on the ground. It makes a world of sense, especially those of you in high sun uh, environments uh, or in Wisconsin in, the, in, a, in a summer day when we have really good sunshine. Um, the rest of the time, they're, they're wildly impractical. The other problem we have with solar cells right this minute is that they are incredibly expensive. Uh, just first order to do this right, and provide a meaningful impact on the system, we may be looking at $20,000 just for solar cells. So if we're talking about a practical and affordable system to get started, it doesn't make sense. This technology will come along, though, and I'll talk about that as we go. Uh, but thank you, an excellent question. Uh, 2010 charging configuration. So this is the actual hardware we're going to use, uh, we have used and have been using to charge the battery. There's our battery, our uh, custom designed and built battery. Um, here is a harness, which is really just an adapter harness. Those of you that know 220 may recognize that three-prong plug. And this plug here is one of those uh, amphenol or equivalent connectors that plugs into the battery and provides for charging. Um, this is the side of the charger that would plug in there, and this is the one that would plug into the wall. And you flip this switch, and you wait four hours, and the battery and our SLA charger and comm controller do the rest. Uh, literally bring it up to a state of charge. Very cool. Uh, instrumentation. Uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about instrumentation because we know this is what pilots uh, like to talk about and think about. You know, before you're going to go fly an electric airplane, most of you, most all of you, are going to be coming from internal combustion engines. So a lot of our time has been spent on what kind of data from this system would be appropriate to report to the pilot and pertinent uh, what kind of feedback information that you're actually going to be able to interpret and use. And again, we've set up the system through the COM bus to manage that information and send it over to you. Uh, and our fuel gauge is essentially the state of charge of the battery. How much gas you got left? How much longer can your motor run off the battery in the state it's currently in? Also displays the highest and lowest state of charge. Um, it has six pages of information currently that you scroll through. That is a, that is a moving target. Uh, we may end up with 12 pages, uh, or if we go to a larger LCD, we may end up with one. But for now, we've got six. 12-volt uh, power supply for radio and flight instruments. So those of you who like choices in flight instruments, the e-flight system will accommodate you because anything that runs on a standard uh, aircraft electrical system will be able to be used for those of you that have for your preferences. And here is what the current instrument configuration is. We actually, not in this slide, but we have an MGL uh, flight uh, instrument that's right off screen here. Uh, but I just wanted to show you a couple of the pages and what kind of information they display. In uh, the left-hand side here, actually, let's start with the actual controls. This right-hand slide, you can see them. Uh, there's a master on-off switch. This is just a keyed switch that flips to the on or off position. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a motor enable gauge. So you simply click that on to turn on the motor controller and allow you to run the motor. The contactors are that um, electrical switch, if you will. So once you turn the contactors, if they're in the off position, you are not live. You are not allowing the high power into the system. Once you click the contactors on, you are. And then you have an instrument master. So this is actually so you can light up whatever digital instrument you have uh, uh, associated with it, your flight instrument. So looking at some of the information uh, that is provided, there's a number of LED lights in the left-hand corner. They're a little difficult to see, but these will be labeled for AirVenture. Uh, there's two greens, two reds, three yellows. You can imagine the kinds of things that are on there, but they, tell, they warn the pilot when something is wrong uh, or something is right. Uh, there's also a general warning light which comes on and flashes you to the pro appropriate screen. Um, but in this case, we're looking at battery mode, uh, and you can see the status, the volts, the motor's off. There's nothing happening when the slide was taking. We're just kind of sitting there, and it's at idle, and everything's okay. And the left-hand slide here, we're actually looking at a battery screen, and the primary thing is state of charge. Uh, when this was taken, we were at an 84% state of charge, so the battery was uh, pretty high. 
uh, in a very good state. The temperatures were happy, 21 and 24, so this would be the lowest cell temperature on the left and the highest cell temperature on the right. And then we also were monitoring the voltage of each individual, 80 cell packs, uh, of which the lowest uh, volt was 4.19, the highest was 4.2, and the motor was off. Very simple stuff. As you scroll, scroll through, we also, as we said, added this sensor. So this is actually uh, providing feedback for the sensor when we're running off of that versus the back EMF. In this case, it's ignoring the sensor because it was running on back EMF, but the alignment of the sensor looked good. So we provided that feedback uh, to the pilot in case your sensor alignment would go out of whack and you didn't know it. So very cool stuff in this system. Um, and there, again, is the schematic. So you can get a feel now after that talk of kind of what the system looks like at a high level. Now let's talk about progress. This is the stuff that I'm most uh, interested in relaying to the public today, and you'll see more at AirVenture on these progress, but I'm kind of giving you a visual update of what's going on. This is me uh, the week before AirVenture last year, 7.22. I was, uh, this is the 2009 configuration. We had the throttle control. That's what my hand is on there. Uh, and we had a little power supply sitting on the seat that was providing the power that came up and, and plugged into here, so through this box. And then this is the comm cable that comes back to the motor controller. So everything was still displaying. We had the instrumentation, uh, but we weren't running off the batteries yet. I'll talk about that why in a second. Oh, here it is, uh, the battery pack. The, these were the batteries that we first selected. Uh, and we selected them because it looked on paper like they were going to be a really good choice. They had very high energy density. Uh, they wouldn't break the bank. They would be something that, that we thought would operate quite well. Well, you can see there's damage here. to The, uh, the battery pack is actually uh, stacked away from us, so it would have been in the battery box with these clamps uh, at the top of the screen. And we found these, uh, these cochem cells actually were not uh, far from ideal. Uh, from what we wanted to do uh, with, the, with the battery system. So uh, this one actually ruptured and contacted the frame and uh, we saw smoke and fire. So uh, just a, a word of warning to anybody that's considering using a pack like this. Uh, it set us back quite a while. So here, this is after AirVenture 820 through 822. We, we ended up having a series of four meetings through the year with our team. Uh, and the team here in the lower right, you can see there's John, there's Pete, and there's Andrew. Uh, all of us. Now you have yellow faces, so I'll come back to you. Um, and this is, uh, again, the 2009 config. We're running off the, um, off the power supply again, and we're starting to integrate some of these new things, like this DC to DC converter, the SLA charger, the, the communication bus. And here, Pete and John on the left-hand side are populating what we thought we'd need, which was a battery, um, a battery management box that had a uh, all the all the associated contactors and switches and fuses in it. Uh, we ended up in the contracted cell moving that to the battery. Uh, uh, September to October, we had a new design for the motor controller so uh, and the motor. So we decided with the motor to do some refinements, uh, mainly in the areas of efficiency and heat dissipation. And we also decided to do a motor controller 10 to kind of clean up our back EMF section of the board, our high power switching section of the board. A um, lot of things going on in this controller, obviously. And uh, version 10 was then contracted to be built uh, around the end of the year, around November. Uh, we also, after we contracted for the battery, uh, which you see the motor mount here on the upper right hand side with the battery mounted in it, and also see uh, we, we do things at Sonex, I think, the right way, which is to provide all the information, all the interfaces to the battery manufacturer so they knew exactly what we expected from a mounting perspective and an envelope. And then in the lower right, this is the actual uh, motor mount you'll see in the airplane when you come see it at AirVenture, uh, 14,500 kilowatt hour pack. Um, this is one of the refinements from motor version 2.0. We're not releasing a lot of details on what we did, but this is the actual motor shaft that was completed, about uh, 12 new components in motor 2.0. Then in December, we started playing with a current loop sensing device, which would actually give us a more reliable and accurate uh, current sensing, which is critical for a number of areas, but if you're trying to, to monitor the health of the system and how much power there is, you got to rely. You got to have reliable current sensing. Then in January, uh, we ended up uh, doing new motor 
the magnet core was finished, and uh, later that time, later that month, the day after, actually, our motor mount arrived and was installed. And this is an early version of the motor we're just using for fit up to the cowling. And then uh, we converted version 2.0 of our DC to DC converter. I think that's what separates the E team, or the E flight team, from a lot of others doing this project. We continually refine and improve. And uh, by the time this thing flies, it will be a very well-tested and thoroughly refined system. Uh, in February of this year, motor 2.0 was completed. So that's what she looked like when she was all put together. Looks familiar. Just has a little longer prop hub on it. So we had to do away with our spool extension. Uh, a lot of cooling and also the, the same exact uh, high power uh, uh, head, head unit board. Then later in February, we got back together as a team and did a lot of harness work. This is on the right-hand side what Pete and Andrew are working on right here. Again, there's the schematics that uh, Pete is particularly so famous for with the Sonics plans. And we're using those schematics to do the wiring uh, of, the, of the new motor controller. In the middle, this is the SLA charger being installed. Uh, at the bottom, you can see also our famous stack of lead-acid batteries to get the equivalent power out of that uh, that custom battery we talked about, you need 28 lead-acid batteries uh, right out of your truck. And then on the left-hand side, this is a, a communication harness for the battery that we started to, to, uh, to build and refine. In uh, March, very exciting time, early March of this year, our new battery arrives. Uh, 300 pounds, 14,500 kilowatt hours. Very cool looking unit. Jeremy? Uh, Yes. Um, what is the weight of the engine? You just mentioned the weight of the battery pack. The, the engine as it sits in this slide with the head unit and everything is about 75 pounds. Thank you. Yep. So uh, then there's the battery. Then we got to the comm testing. So this is where I really enjoy personally this kind of lab work. When you start to uh, take the harnesses, the communication harnesses that you saw being wired up earlier, you hook them up. Uh, we've got our little power supply to supply unit to the brain of the battery and, of course, our PC to be able to output and communicate with the battery. That's really fun, cool stuff. And as with all devices that you get for the first time, we had to learn it. Uh, we had to learn the data stream. There's always, with things this complex, there's always little things that get in the way that have to be worked around. So we certainly had our share with this system. Uh, later in April, our 3.0 winding arrives. Yes, we had the goal after te thoroughly testing and working with our motor 2.0, we thought we could even get better efficiency out of the motor. So we endeavored to build a motor 3.0. Here is what the motor 3.0 looked like. This is now fast forwarded to May. Uh, you can see the main refinements of the motor are here. This is the same spool extension, some of the same core components from 2.0. And uh, you can see uh, same reasons, more efficiency, more cooling. In um, May of, of 2010, this year, the Motor Controller 10 arrives. Beautiful looking motor controller, very clean. And we also started testing with our charger and our big lead acid stack. So once we dialed in this charger to the big lead acid stack, it was ready to move over uh, to our custom built battery. Uh, in June, our external sensor added. Uh, obviously, I'm jumping through a lot of things. You can see I'm fast-forwarding months at a time. There's constant work being done between all these slides, but these are kind of the major milestones. External sensor added to 3.0. We decided our sensorless back EMF commutation wasn't, wasn't going to be ideal uh, for some of the high-power runs. So we had an idea to put this external sensor, and this is actually a supplemental control board um, over the top of version 10 that controls this sensor uh, with a little adapter on the back of the motor. Very ingenious, and it's been a huge success. And then later in June, we got back together, June 19th. That's only a few short weeks ago. We uh, did some testing with our external sensing. We also integrated the new battery. And in the lower right-hand corner, that's Andrew giving us a thumbs up with the data stream you see coming out of the battery and going to our own uh, uh, communication bus uh, in the controller. Very cool. Here's some more slides, lots of activity at this June meeting. Um, this is the battery we talked about on the left-hand side being lifted up by the forklift, and there it is into position. Pete's inserting one of the bolts, and Dad was on the other side there. Uh, then on the right-hand side, before we went and loaded the battery, we just uh, got it close enough where we could run our comm harnesses to the brain of the battery and ensure that the instrument was going to report everything properly. 
And then on the lower left-hand side, Andrew is, yes, doing some troubleshooting with the battery. There's a couple of circuit boards you can see with the battery cover off that we use to communicate with, the, with our own COM bus. We've got to make sure this, this is our own software, our own proprietary software uh, on this board, which is pretty cool. And then on the right-hand side, uh, this is our world-famous lead-acid battery stack uh, hooked up to the motor, and we did a, a large number of high-power runs, once again, with motor 3.0. Very satisfied with those results. Our longest run was about 25 minutes uh, for a ground run. That's pretty impressive. Then uh, in July, uh, the wiring of the new pre-charge circuit. That's uh, this month, so this is last week. Uh, you can see there's our familiar control uh, board. Uh, getting some updates for pre-charge circuit, and I'll let the guys talk about that during Air Venture as far as the needs for the pre-charge, but it, we found it's a very critical component to a high power system. And now I'm doing more of the pre, we're doing more of the pre-charge circuit testing, we're testing the DC to DC converter and the SLA charger, so it was a very busy day last Saturday at Sonics. Uh, amidst the thunder and lightning and heavy rain, <laughs> we were doing all this testing, but you can see just about every plug is populated on the left-hand side of the battery, all of which is running to our main controller. Uh, and we're monitoring the health of the battery. We're going through charge testing. We're making sure this data output is correct. And we're just having a good time geeking out. Jeremy, um, yes. um, we had a question. What does SLA stand for in the SLA charger? You know, I do not know the answer to that question, but it's our charger. Uh, that's all I have to say. It's our, it's our monitoring board for our charger. That would be an excellent question for Andrew when he comes about all of his uh, acronyms. So now moving to the, I know how it works though, and it does work. The two-place uh, electric sport aircraft, I'm going to talk about the airframes briefly with our system. And uh, this is the hybrid you saw me talk about on that very first slide. Um, this is the hybrid between the YX and the Xenos. So a YX uh, would be about there as far as the, what the wing tip looked like, and the Xenos would be way out here. So it's that hybrid same cockpit area, so we already have all those parts. Uh, a little bit shorter tail, we probably use the Xenos tail cone and just a little bit smaller tail in the back. So this is really an, an airplane we felt we could build in a big hurry and uh, may build in a big hurry uh, when the system is proven in the YX. Um, it's a modified Xenos. We talked about using flaps instead of spoilers. So you'll get the slow speed characteristics. Jeremy, um, yeah. um, several people, including Andrew, have chimed in that it's sealed lead acid charger. Thank you very much, Andrew, as usual, coming through. Um, eight foot flaps instead of spoilers, aerobatic tips. Uh, the span just under 36 feet, so we feel it's important when you build these airplanes, and you may note the wingspans of some of the other electric airplanes out there that have flown are pretty large, again, to accommodate the lower power, uh, power plants they have. Um, obviously, electric propulsion with shortened wing tips, uh, shortened tail tips, and uh, control aux battery in the tail cone. So we want to get as much weight aft as we can in that. And we've actually talked about doing things like moving the wings uh, forward and aft to be able to accommodate that. Um, performance is very good. A uh, climb of 800 to 1,000 feet a minute with a flight time of 50 minutes and a range of 87 miles. This is something we could, again, do very, very quickly at Sonics once the, uh, once the power system is refined and proven. Uh, and that's what it looks like uh, as a model. Uh, this is actually a Xenos model, so it'd be just a little bit shorter wingspan. Uh, some of the early motor and those batteries that I already warned you about. So one more shameless plug. If you're interested in learning more, like the sealed lead acid uh, charger uh, and, and some of the other fun acronyms and things we've been working on, uh, come to AirVenture. Uh, there's one more big plug I want to make, and that's down here at the bottom. These I already mentioned, uh, the Tuesday with Pete Buck uh, about motors, the Wednesday with Andrew Pierce on the controllers, and also uh, on Monday, the opening day of the show, I'm going to be presenting one, obviously, with help from the team. On, on some of the airframes. Uh, all of these demonstrations, since our E flight, our N270DC will be in the same building, the GE ALC, all of these presentations will be interactive uh, with the airframe, which I think is very important for people to see the hardware. And then on um, Friday, this is the big day, uh, there is actually an electric aircraft symposium 
this is put together by a friend of ours, Craig Willen, along with the EAA staff. Uh, and it's in the Founders Wing of the EAA Museum. It's open to the public, but there's limited uh, spaces available. So if your passion is electric aircraft, I feel this is the ideal place for you to be. And my father, John, along with the rest of the team, will be there and participating in the noon uh, roundtable discussion about electric airplanes. So definitely make the trip to AirVenture. Come see it. And with that, that's uh, the main part of my presentation, and um, I'll entertain any other questions that I may or may not be able to answer. All right, Jeremy, that was great. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know we're all going crazy uh, getting ready for Air Ventures, so the timing on this is, was a bit of a challenge. Uh, we'll start with a question for Brandon. Uh, what is the risk of fire should a malfunction occur, and what about uh, uh, LiPo batteries catching fire violently in a crash? Mm-hmm. Sure, I'll, I'll address uh, both of those, and, and this may be the best way to, to see the system. This is from our meeting in June. Um, in my opinion, the, the only way you're really going to get fire is if you have a short of some kind. And, and again, that I keep coming back to that word isolation, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but I'm just going to say anybody that is working in power electronics and working at the power levels that we are better have a good answer for you as to how this, the high is, is isolated from the low and what kind of safety mechanisms are in place uh, for the ground crew or for the first responder personnel. Um, in a crash, uh, number one, you're in a sonics, which is a huge advantage for survivability in a crash. It's a solid airframe. Uh, number two, in order to have a short, you actually would have to have an impact of the front end of the airplane. And again, I'm not going to talk uh, too much about it because you'd have to have severed wires and with any electrical system, it's impossible to protect completely against uh, those situations. But I will talk about the actual battery unit itself. It's a self-contained battery unit of which has individual cell packs in it which are also all protected. And, and when you have uh, the high power, which you actually have uh, the plus over in this area, and the minus over on this side, uh, you'd need to connect the plus with the minus. So once power is cut to the system, they lose their connectivity, and anybody coming to work on the airplane is going to be protected. Um, that's really important. That's where we talked about having the ability to shut the power off and, and, and protect the people. So it's built into the battery, and in my opinion, that's the most dangerous part of the system, and we've covered it. Okay, uh, Jeremy, we might have a guest on the line. Uh huh. Are you there? Good, e Good evening, Jeremy. How are we? Hello, Hello Andrew. <laughs> what a pleasant surprise. It, it's been and, a long time. Andrew volunteered to help with any questions that come up that would be in his field of expertise, so I brought him on. All the three-letter acronyms. I, I was going to add on to what Jeremy said concerning the battery, that, that I think people have seen lots of pictures of LiPo batteries exploding on Google. And uh, the batteries that are used in our battery pack don't have much in the way of, of uh, association with those guys. These are very robust cells. They're very well tested. Uh, people can stick nails into them and not necessarily bother them. And uh, so that you, you shouldn't confuse the pack we have here with uh, things that you would uh, use, say, in an RC environment. And I'll expand a little bit, Andrew. These are actual aluminum U channels running all the way across uh, and tied to a center bulkhead. So it's very important to us, and that was one of our main design criteria, that the containment of the batteries be very robust. Okay, let's go to another question. Uh, Tim asks, if the average home uses 756 kilowatts a month, how does a single charge compare? Okay. <laughs> I think I'm going to put my microphone back on mute again, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can give you some, some very rough numbers. You know, if, if we're charging our pack for about four hours, I would estimate that the total cost of the electricity, and, and this is something we'll be able to give you better numbers for as we, can, as we continue our charge and discharge, but roughly a couple dollars. Uh, roughly, a, uh, probably between a dollar and two dollars of electricity. So your mom hasn't said, your mom hasn't said anything about your electric bills over the hanger <laughs> going through the roof. Well, 
when the air conditionings are fired up, I guarantee you we're burning a lot more, uh, and, and obviously the heat for those uh, cold Wisconsin winters. But, you know, the, we're, we're trying to be as green as possible, and the efficiency aspect, which is highly touted uh, by those that are advocates of electric aircraft, uh, we believe, our team believes, that uh, these will be proven over time. And, and we will see uh, really marked efficiency improvements. And, and, and it's a challenge for the whole community um, to supply as clean an electron as you possibly can to us. That's, uh, that means you uh, utilities, and that means you consumers demanding that we have uh, clean electron sources. Okay, uh, Joe has a question about uh, why not go up in voltage and take advantage of the increased power at 500 plus volts? <laughs> okay. Andrew, you want to take that one? That's a, that's a pretty, pretty good question. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we've, we set ourselves a challenge very early on, well, I don't know whether it was you or me, Jeremy, but someone else who's in a picture standing next to me in the slide that's showing you said it's that challenge, as did uh, uh, Jeremy's dad. And uh, we've actually, our system is designed that it could certainly operate at that sort of voltage level, um, but it has been a fairly big technical challenge just for us to run into the 300 volt uh, area. And that's something I guess we'll touch upon at the uh, forums in, uh, at Oshkosh. Um, but we picked a particular number that we thought was reasonable. It was certainly higher than what the other uh, folks uh, are using. And uh, we're not saying we wouldn't go higher in future, Jeremy. Would you agree? I totally agree. And as we've continued to learn more, that becomes more and more of a viable option all the time. Uh, as everybody knows out there, uh, you know, our, our primary focus right now is in flying this aircraft, N270DC, and that is entirely our focus right now with the limited number amount of time we have with all of our other lives. In fact, I, I should point out, uh, Pete Buck has a full-time job at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Andrew, who's on the line, has a full-time job. Uh, at Gobarco, they, they both work very hard in their day jobs and have a lot of responsibility. So you could consider this as a free time project for both of them. As far as my father and I, uh, we have a ton of projects going on at Sonics outside of the daily activities, which is hard enough, uh, shipping airplanes at the rate we have. Uh, but we also have this thing called the Subsonics Jet. We also have a uh, 1X single place airplane. So there's a lot of projects uh, in the hopper at Sonics, and I, I guarantee you we're all doing the best we can with the time we have. Uh, but I just wanted to address that, that uh, you know, we're, we're, we're working really hard and we want to fly this system first. And, and hopefully you all have seen with these slides a visual representation of how much expertise there is in our, in our team and how far we believe we'll, we've come in a short amount of time and how far we'll go in a short amount of time. All right, well, Brian asked the uh, million dollar question, which is, are we going to see this fly at Air Venture 2010? Uh, honestly, right now, Brian, it's looking unlikely for flight at AirVenture, and I'll, I'll tell you a reason why uh, as I get to the slide that was taken uh, this weekend. Um, as with all highly integrated systems, we've also, as we kind of expected, found a couple of issues here with the communication between the battery and the controllers. Uh, not easily fixable. Uh, perhaps if we had unlimited time or at least a couple of weeks to, to hammer on it. But right now, uh, that's the biggest thing standing in the way. We also need to license the aircraft with the FAA. And the very last thing we want to do is to slap something together, if you will, that's not in any of our na nature of any of our team and take it out in front of thousands of people and, and do a disservice to the industry by having some kind of accident. But I will say this, there's a very high chance that we'll have it uh, as a demonstration, be able to run it off of this battery um, and show you what the system is capable of in its current form, which is very impressive. Okay, uh, David had a question about the motor. It appears to be an in-runner design. Is there any internal airflow through the motor other than just the external flow over the motor? Sure. sure. Yes. Question. That's the answer to the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Alan has a question about uh, comparing your design of the engine to the one that we saw last year. Uh, I mm -hmm. believe he's referring to, to the one from Unique. Yeah, the one from Unique is actually very similar to our motor. Uh, I think the best way for you, the American consumer, and anybody in the world uh, to observe the difference is to simply look at them. 
They'll both be on display uh, at the air show, and you'll be able to physically see the differences. But uh, obviously, if you look at the spec sheets, uh, you'll, you'll see what the power differences are, and you'll physically see what the size differences are. Okay, and, and uh, Jeremy, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Do you want to add on? Uh, Andrew? I was just going to say, just generally, I think that, that our system is is designed to run at high voltage. That's been our target all along. So. Okay, uh, Brad has a question about uh, what I think a lot of people have the, the the perception of is what's the noise level like of an electric motor compared to something like an V or a Jabru. Well, I guess I'll start, and then I'll have Andrew talk about it, because he's got plenty of time behind that little throttle you see on the screen right there. Um, the, the, uh, it, it's remarkable how quiet it is. Uh, the, the only noise you really have from this system uh, is from the propeller. And we all know uh, from our internal combustion experience that the absolute worst case for testing any kind of motor that relies on cooling air uh, is to try to run it on the ground. Also, the worst case for noise is running it on the ground when you get cavitation between the prop blades and the ground. Um, so it, it still sounds mean. It sounds angry in our ground runs. Uh, in the air, it's going to be remarkably quiet. Well, as someone who's and, as someone who stood around listening to this thing during a full or a close to full power run, it is. It is uh, impressive and and fairly loud, but it's all prop noise. That's right, and and that's exactly what you'd expect. Actually, I think it's a misconception. You know, people when they hear a Jabiru or an Aero V run on the ground, you, you you a lot of that exact same thing is happening. You're getting cavitation with the prop, and that's that's the reason you generally have to cover your ears because of that cavitation. It's a very uncomfortable sound, but uh, in in the air again, it's going to be awesome. You guys are going to love this thing. Okay, uh, Ira had a question about what modifications would have to be made to your existing Zenos, Zenos motor glider kit to accommodate the electric uh, motor system once it's fully developed. And if this is the Ira that I know, hello, Ira. Um, and, and yes, it, it, we have ha fielded this question from quite a few of our current customers. Uh, and, and this is the stock answer for everyone. Uh, is it possible? Yes. Obviously, you can take an airframe uh, and in this picture, you obviously have a Y-X, and you can chop out a portion of the of the firewall and move, uh, put a different motor mount on it, and 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 make the system work. From an ideal CG standpoint, and and allowing for a full payload of two passengers, which is generally what our Sonics and Y-X and Xenos customers want, and a full payload of baggage, it's definitely not ideal. Um, so so I think what you'll you'll, you'll see us go toward is toward encouraging you to do a different airframe if your passion is electric. Uh, but we're not ruling that out. None of us on the team are ruling it out, but we will wait until we have final numbers uh, on the package and on the system uh, before we, we answer that definitively. Okay, Tim had a question about, you've mentioned the DC to DC converter. Does that clean the power to the motor? In other words, does it give a cleaner sine wave? Andrew. Do you, do you want me to give an answer on that? Yeah. Uh, the DC to DC converter for us uh, is basically supplying our, we don't run it as a 12-volt bus, we actually run it as an 18-volt bus. And uh, that unit there is, is designed to pick up and supply that and, get, and give a guaranteed nice clean signal for, uh, I should say, supply for all of the other parts of the system. It is not responsible, it's not an inverter system, we are not uh, altering, bucking or boosting the voltage going to the motor. Uh, so it's only for the internal side. But it is a very important part. The, the, the system is designed to run off the DC to DC converter, which is a fairly reasonably high power unit, it's 20 amps in that thing, um, and uh, for it to switch seamlessly back and forth between uh, what was going to be a sealed lead acid battery but is now, as it turns out, Jeremy, a lead acid battery. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that answers your question. Okay, Norman would like to know if you could tell us the weight of the motor and is the power rating at peak like a gas engine or is it a continuous like most electric engines? It's continuous, first off. Uh, you, the, the cool part about uh, electric motors is you produce 100% of the torque at 1 RPM. So it is a, is a very flat, if you will, uh, power curve. Uh, as far as, um, what was the other part of the question? 
Sorry, just I wanted just to the weight of the uh, engine, yeah. and you might as well mention the battery pack one more time. Yeah, as I already stated, the weight of what you see in this picture is approximately 75 pounds. And uh, so those of you, I, I guess I always like to cover this a little bit um, as far as the whole system weight, and I'll go back to this uh, very visual, iconic representation of the system. Um, about 75 pounds right there. As we already told you, 300 pounds right there. And I'd say roughly 10 pounds here. And that's all you've got to carry. So again, from a CG standpoint, it would be ideal to put the pilot and the battery in exactly the same place. Obviously not practical. But uh, that's something we'll be working through as a team as we start to optimize that. Okay, and uh, Casey would like to know if the power is being cut off, uh, is the power cut off being provided via contactor, and if so, is it a sealed or open one? Uh, it is. <coughs> Excuse me. Andrew, you want to answer that? Oh, no, yeah, that, absolutely it is a, uh, a sealed contactor. And we've, we've gone to a lot of effort um, both before this battery mob were involved, um, and obviously in this new design, to look at the stuff that Jeremy was saying before, isolation, 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 and also ensuring that we, uh, we have uh, good drive for the contactors and that we treat them well. Um, that was a little bit about the pre-charge stuff that, that Jeremy was mentioning earlier. So, absolutely sealed. We're learning a, a good share of information from the guys out there that are, are running high-powered electric cars. And we expect them to learn a lot from us, <laughs> and vice versa. You know, so it, it's great. It's great to see all the development, and it's and it's great. It's quite refreshing, honestly, to see others struggling with some of the same issues that we have and succeeding on some of the same areas that we've succeeded. It's it's really cool. Okay, Alan would like to know if the individual cells within the pack are replaceable in case of a cell failure. The answer is yes, and the answer is not easily. So, um, you know, as far as the, the battery, we as a team are looking at it as a single unit down here. Uh, we've done a lot of, obviously, working with the top end, the brain, but uh, replacing any single cell package would be a pain, which is, is our reasoning for monitoring them so carefully, insisting on that, and, uh, and not allowing them to get in a position where they, where they go bad, if you will. If they're treated kindly, uh, our battery vendor has, uh, has actually said 10 to 20,000 charge cycles can be expected out of these cells. That's pretty exciting. Okay, and John would like to know if uh, this setup allows for, gener uh, for generating power and descent for a charge of the battery. Um, at this point, we have not allowed for that. Um, certainly something we could look at in the future. Can I add to that a little bit, Jeremy? Yeah, please. Um, um, I'm sure Pete would be okay with me talking about this yeah. slightly. The, the, uh, there was some tests done to that extent to try and work out how much benefit we would get out of a regenerative system. And ultimately, we decided when looking at some of the specific controller stuff that at this time, uh, trying to support that just isn't worth it. Uh, the amount of stuff that we would get out of descent isn't uh, worth the design, overhead, uh, various things that come with that at this point. So we might change our mind in the future, but at the, at the moment we, we don't think that that's where we want to go. Okay, and uh, another John had asked, what type of DC motor have you chose? So I think you need to clarify how that came about. Just a br brushless DC motor. Uh, you can Google it and take a read. But uh, the, the reasons for that, it's, it's uh, virtually nowhere. Uh, it's a permanent magnet motor, uh, and, and it's about as simple a device as, as you can get. Um, the scaling has been where the challenges have been. So there's a lot of small brushless DC motors out there. Uh, there's almost none that are the same size as the, as the one we're running. And uh, so there's been a, a continual learning process on our part as we've made these refinements. So you've manufactured everything. Correct. We own it. And, and that's something I just can't stress enough to everybody out there. Um, there's a couple of things that go with that. Number one, when you create all of this stuff, it's a lot harder, obviously. You have to spend a lot of time on the front end, a lot of time in the middle, and a lot of time in the end uh, <laughs> getting things refined to work right. Um, uh, the advantage, obviously, on the flip side is that once you're done with that process of, of years of development, you own it. 
and by Sonics Aircraft and the E-Flight team uh, owning this technology and, and these designs, we're going to be able to offer them at a fraction of the price of anybody else. And that's personally very exciting to me. Okay, RD would like to know about the, uh, if you're using the same diameter pitch uh, prop as you would on the Aero V, and if not, what are the differences? Yeah, great question. Uh, this is actually the propeller in this slide, which is the perfect slide for this. That's a 3300 Jabru propeller. Uh, what's cool about an electric motor, it doesn't care whether it's going clockwise or counterclockwise. It doesn't matter, or vice versa. <laughs> it can go any which way. So uh, we have a wide range of propellers, and that's another advantage that obviously the E-Flight team has with our partnership with Sonics and being able to work with the Sonics inventory. We've got a lot of props on the wall. And uh, through our testing, uh, you can see an Aero-V prop way off in the distance here. Um, that's actually a Sensinic ground adjustable, which you may see appear uh, on an E-Flight project coming soon. But um, the bottom line is the 3300 Jabru prop, uh, in, in our team's opinion, as we did those high power tests, represented the best chance of generating the most amount of power in, in the ideal curve for our motor. So that's why it's on there. But could it fly in a VW prop? Most definitely, yes. Okay, uh, Stephen has a question. Uh, one issue involved in operating with battery power, both for my laptop and electric car, was battery seasoning. For an electric car, it meant continually stressing the battery to max range, which could lead to flame outs. An annoyance in a car, a real problem in an aircraft. Will your battery technology avoid such requirements for seasoning? Oh. Andrew, <laughs> you want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, it's interesting. I'm not sure that... Um, I've heard that in respect to LiPo batteries. I think my, a lot of the, I'd be curious to know what sort of battery chemistry um, he's, uh, he's use, he was using his car. Um, the, in terms, if we're worried about the, in, in terms of the, the, the type of chemistry used, whether depending on how it's charged, it, um, uh, whether it ends up affecting the battery life or whether if it's not fully discharged, it won't charge properly, et cetera, that, that isn't, an issue with the battery chemistry we're using in this battery. I'm not sure whether I'm answering the question, but uh, um, we're not aware that that's an issue with, with uh, our battery pack as it stands. And actually, the battery vendor we have has a tremendous amount of experience with these cells in all kinds of applications. So uh, uh, if, if, if it is a concern, maybe it's something we'll find, <laughs> but, but I doubt it. Uh, they, these have been thoroughly tested, these sub-packs, in very many different configurations. Okay, got a couple of questions about how efficient is the motor uh, kilowatts in versus horsepower out at cruise RPM? That will be to be determined. Uh, I, I would rather not speculate on what that efficiency is going to be. Uh, it's pretty easy to do some internet research right now on brushless DC motors and efficiency, and the number that you're going to find is going to be between 90 and 98 percent efficient, and that's a fairly wide range. Uh, but, but most of that number has to do with uh, the cooling we talked about and the effective and efficient commutation of the motor, the proper commutation. So we're trying to minimize losses, and in an ideal situation, uh, it's hard to beat the efficiency of a brushless TC motor. And those of you familiar with uh, internal combustion efficiencies, it's not even close. Uh, uh, internal combustion motors can't even compete. So um, when, when it's designed and built properly, uh, very highly efficient. Okay, uh, William had a question about uh, why not mount the batteries within the wing for the C of G issue? Uh -huh. Maybe an, an opportunity in the future. Uh, structural loading is very important. Uh, batteries are a little different than fuel um, in that, um, you know, the fuel is going to slosh around a little bit, and it, it, the, the, the density and the size of the batteries is very important. Let's also talk about wiring. Uh, it's not like running a fuel line. Uh, to your motor, you have to actually consider the size and weight of copper wire in order to make runs. So there's a lot of things to go into that, but in an ideal situation, yes, you're on the right track. I think as, as a designer, that's uh, you know something that's very appealing to me. Uh, the challenges would be to contract with the battery company to come up with a configuration that works, and, uh, and that can work in multiple cell packs, and then again, you've got to wire them all together. So for this, this first swing, where I'm going with this, the reason we chose this configuration that you're looking at is so that we didn't have wire runs, wires running all over the place. It's a self-contained unit. 
but certainly in the future, uh, doing different shaped batteries uh, would be will be in our future. Okay, uh, Stephen had a question about the fuses. Um, where are they, and what do you do when one blows in flight? <laughs> I'll have a go on that if you like, Jeremy. Sure. Um, okay, well, the, the idea is that we don't blow any fuses. Um, there are multiple circuit protection devices within the design. So for the lower power, the lower voltage stuff, we use polyfuses everywhere. So if something does, if we do have a, a short with something that's low voltage, um, you know, if you take a load off, then it can operate again. We, we, we also use some uh, newer types of automotive switches, again, for the low power stuff that can automatically trip and recover. For the high power stuff, which is really where your question is coming from, um, it's, uh, we, we, the software on the motor controller itself um, monitors current and monitors it very closely, manages power being applied to the motor. Uh, the drive electronics um, uses desaturation techniques to monitor the power semiconductors to ensure that they do not deliver more current than they're capable. And beyond that, we uh, use uh, a type of silicon fuse in the physical battery, which would be at the last resort. So we have no interest in blowing fuses in the, in the, uh, in the unit itself. Um, and that is, would be to save the batteries, essentially, and save the wiring if, uh, if that was to trip. Um, and uh, yeah, so you won't be changing them in flight, that's for sure. But you know, the, the mm -hmm. proper design of the unit um, is all about ensuring that that isn't necessary. I'd like to, to add we're all glider pilots, <laughs> at least uh, John and Pete and I are, uh, and, and I, I guess that's important. I mean, absolute worst case, you lose your motor, you shut everything down, and what's important to me is that if you do have this fault, uh, anything go wrong, and, and I think we've covered about all the bases we possibly can. Uh, there, of course, will always be scenarios you can't plan for, but uh, for all those scenarios, you, you cut power. You, you, you shut everything off and you land. And hopefully you've got a place to do that. Okay, uh, Roger wanted to know, uh, will the charge be done with the battery remaining in the aircraft or will it need to be removed for charging? It'll be done in the aircraft. So the charge connector is actually that red plug right there. And so the harness would run from that uh, charger I showed you before right on up and plug in there. Okay, uh, Brad had a question about, uh, he states, one of the safety concerns that pilots often prepare for and rehearse for is an electrical failure. In most instances, if such were the case in a traditional aircraft, you still have the engine control. In a fully electric aircraft, is it possible to isolate the power plant so that if you had electrical problems, there's still a reliable way to control engine power? Custom made for Andrew to answer. Oh, goodness. Um, if you have electrical problems. Okay, the, it depends on the nature of the electrical problem. We, we have a redundant system in the sense that, um, you know, if the DC, practically speaking, the, the supply for the digital electronics is coming from the DC to DC converter. And that is, of course, oversized uh, for what the real requirement is. Um, and Jeremy, as Jeremy can, can happily vouch for, we have run off that, we've run off uh, independent power supplies, but uh, we're designed to run off a lead-acid battery in the event that uh, we lose that particular um, output. And uh, that's the short answer: your your redundancy, <laughs> your backup. So you, you you have another battery. You got this battery, <laughs> and then if that battery goes south, you shut her down, and at least you won't lose your flight instrumentation. Which correct. And, and also, every... the... go ahead. I'm sorry, Andrew. Yeah, I was going to say the, the the system designed also on a modular basis that that for example, if the bus controller um, can, can't communicate with anything anymore. The motor controller operates independently. So there's only so much redundancy you can and want to build into such a system, else you end up duplicating absolutely everything. Um, but you know, we, we've taken what we consider to be appropriate steps to ensure that um, you know, if you have a minor electrical problem, that the, the rest of the system is not affected. OK. Um... Alan would like to know what the operating range, uh, R, 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 RPM range of the motor is. Mm -hmm. Well, with this optimized Jabru 3300 propeller, uh, we would say identical to a Sonics. So that would be a cruise RPM of, say, 2700 RPM and maybe a max RPM of uh, 3300 uh, 3, RPM would be about the max. 
But again, that's to be determined in flight tests. Those are just preliminary numbers based on our ground tests, and uh, we'll be able to answer that question definitively after our flight testing begins. Jeremy, certainly the motor has run at higher RPM unloaded, though, hasn't it? Yep, sure has, up, up to 4,000, upwards of 4,000. Pretty cool. Okay, um, Eric had a question about, is the goal of the project a technology demonstrator or a marketable product? Both. <laughs> um, to be honest, uh, that, was a, that was a joking answer. Uh, it, it's it's going to depend. Um, it's going to depend on just like all of our products we put out there. Um, if, if we find there's a strong demand, it makes financial sense, uh, everything is working properly, we're confident that we can support it at the highest of levels, just like we do all of the products we put out there. Um, then yeah, it'll become a product. For now, it's under the Hornet's Nest R&D section, and uh, we consider this to be a, a strictly a research project. Yeah, and, and I'm very proud to say we haven't taken a dime of uh, any kind of uh, government assistance, any kind of grant assistance. Um, it's a, it's a, everybody in the inner circle has invested a huge amount in terms of time and money. Um, and obviously, uh, the, the, the ideal situation for us would be to recoup some of that investment and, and, uh, and turn it into some money for all of us, for all of our hard work. But if it doesn't, uh, it'll be for good reasons. It wasn't meant to be. Okay, uh, Kevin has a, what I think is a very good question is, how are you handling moisture and water infiltration? <laughs> Great topic. Andrew, discussion. you can talk about that, sure. Uh, sure, okay. Um, I, I guess that that's something that we've been uh, looking at for some period of time. Um, it is a design objective for this thing. Obviously, it has to operate in different environments. Um, and uh, we have been experimenting, just, just as an example, with the printed circuit boards and types of conformal coat to ensure that they are well protected uh, for, from condensation. And that's been one of the development challenges because uh, one of the things that have delayed us, uh, I think it's, am I allowed to say this, Jeremy? You can stop me at any time. Um, one of the, we, 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 go ahead. It, it's a little bit like the, the battery thing. We've been learning as we go along and um, we certainly have been experimenting with various different types of conformal coat to protect high voltage from low voltage in the case of moisture. And we found that uh, that actually hurt us tremendously. It caused us all sorts of problems and so we're very w well aware and it's part of our objective to ensure that this thing can operate in a uh, moisture environment and uh, if you look at the connectors that are used on it, they're uh, generally speaking military grade. Um, they've been a pain for us to get to the stage, they're a pain to wire but they're really, really good and really robust um, and you'll see a standard eyes on that type of uh, connector through, through the design. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, we're aware of it and that is our design objective. Um, and I, I, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a sheen on the floor in this picture. And that sheen, that, that light, is actually moisture from an, a tremendously humid day. So we were running off of these big lead-acid batteries on a day that was about 98% humidity. And immediately when we opened the hangar door, the condensation filled the hangar and all the electrical components. And it ran. And, and that's very important, uh, but it's something, obviously, as Andrew stated, we're aware of and will continue to refine and be ready for. Okay, um, Jeremy, a little bit off topic, but what is the status of the 1X project? We had a great webinar on that earlier in the year. Yep. Um, can you give us a little bit uh, of an update there? Come to Air Venture. Come to Air Venture, my friend. Uh, honestly, um, a as you all know, and as Andrew and Pete and my father are all well aware, uh, it's been a number of obsessions uh, for me personally the last few months, and one of those obsessions is uh, is the 1X. Uh, night and day, burning the midnight oil and, and working to complete it. And uh, I think people are really going to like the result and come to Air Venture. Okay, what are the dates of Air Venture again, Jeremy? <laughs> well, they're the end of July, uh, Charlie, but if you can't tell anybody. <laughs> July 26th through August 1st. <laughs> it's almost like you're wearing a boom microphone and selling soup. But uh, really, um, 
Yeah, c come on out to Air Venture, and and I guarantee you uh, the taste you got here from from Andrew and the kind of brain and and character that he is. I guarantee you'll enjoy his talk. Um, Pete is about as knowledgeable as they come as far as aircraft component design, uh, manufacturing. Uh, worked on a lot of projects that he can't tell us about that will blow uh, anybody's mind. And uh, of course, you all know my father and what uh, he his his resume entails and some of the things he's done. So between this team, you know, we've we've got a pretty full slate. And uh, check out our website, SonicsAircraft.com, and pull up the Air Venture schedule of events and. Come to the 1X forums, come to the uh, booth and check out the 1X, come to any of the E-Flight forums, come to the Subsonics forums. Uh, there will be some, some very pleasant surprises at the show. Great. Well, Andrew and Jeremy, I want to thank you for taking time so close to uh, the big event uh, to put this presentation on. Um, thanks for uh, spending the time putting the presentation together. and. Uh, We'll see you at Air Venture, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. And with that, we're going to call it an evening, and thanks for tuning in. Good night. Thanks much.